Now, let's go to yet another important standard, and that is accuracy. Because you could be clear and precise and inaccurate. And let me explain how this can take place. Uh, here is my favorite example. It's what happened uh, about five or six years ago when every State Department of Education in the country announced using statistics, tables, graphs, and numbers galore that their students in their state had scored above the national average. Every state scored above the national average. And they all had the numbers to prove it. Well, this couldn't be accurate because everyone cannot be above the national average. Well, what had happened? There was a lot of precision there, but it was precision that was based on massaging the statistics. And so, though clear and in a way very precise, also very inaccurate. Now, let me illustrate again precision and inaccuracy. Here is a precise statement about me. I'm 42.3 feet tall. That's a very precise statement. It's also blatantly inaccurate. Do you realize that 54.6% of all married couples, very easy to say it, and that's very precise, but is it true? People are very impressed by precision, and therefore con artists and manipulators make sure they cite statistics. And the statistics may not hear it. The first essay that I read in college in an English class was How to Lie with Statistics. And I shall never forget it. And the point was, don't necessarily believe that precision is accuracy. Numbers can mystify. OK, so now we want accuracy. What questions get at accuracy? First of all, we need clarity and precision to understand what is said. But then, is that true? Is that the way things are? How could we check this? How could we test this? How could we find out if this is really this way as represented? So if somebody has represented things as being a certain way, we want to figure out whether that is accurate. Is this testimony, which was given in detail, true or is it false? We know the details of the testimony, but is it accurate? Is there a corroborating witness? In each case, then, we seek accuracy in addition to clarity and precision. But you could express a thought that was clear, that was precise, that was accurate, but also irrelevant to the question. And so it will be very easy for me to state facts about my students, which are true and clear and precise, but really ought not to be taken into account in grading, because it's not relevant to their grade. Suppose I said this, I have found this student very, very irritating. This student engages in behavior that really sets my ego off. And I feel a lot of hostility coming from this student and I feel a lot of hostility toward this student, therefore I'm going to give them a low grade. Well, we understand what you're saying. We even understand psychologically why you may be disturbed by this, but is this really relevant? So now we're concerned with the question of relevant, the standard of relevance. Relevance is a universal standard, as is clarity and precision and accuracy, because we always want to be clear. We, want, we always want to be precise as the context requires, and we want to be accurate. But we also want to be relevant. We have a certain question before us, a certain problem before us. Relevance is the ability to consider only those factors that bear on the question, and to distinguish those other factors that may be true and may be accurate, but don't bear on the question. And so we want to develop in our students a nose for relevance. Now, where do you get this nose for relevance? You start to pay attention to how the same facts may bear on one question but not on another. To see how a question sort of determines a range of things that are relevant to it. If the question is ethical, then moral principles are relevant. 
If the question is legal, then the laws are relevant. If the question is chemical, then the periodic chart may be relevant. But if the question is ethical, the periodic chart may be irrelevant. And if the question is legal, whether it is moral or not moral may not be the question that we consider. So the ability to adjust your thinking to the demands of the question and to realize that different questions have different demands, intellectually speaking, is the standard of relevance and the ability to discern it. So we want students whose thinking is clear, precise, accurate, and relevant. Now that's not all, because you could have answers that, and thinking that was clear, precise, accurate, relevant, and superficial. And so we take on another universal standard that is universal in the sense that wherever complexity is involved, depth is in order. However, it is not always involved if the question is a superficial question, because superficial thinking is appropriate for superficial questions. And we do ask some superficial questions, and it may be important to get accurate superficial answers. So when you're filling out certain kinds of forms, we're not interested in deep questions about your personality or your philosophy. We may just want, to, want you to know, do you want to buy this or don't you want to buy this? You know, and if you do, do you want to elect this payment plan or that payment plan? And that's all. That's what we want. That's all we need. And if you tell us problems about your life, they may be very important problems, but we may not be interested in them. They may not be relevant. So depth in answers is not always relevant, but sometimes is. It's universal in the sense that wherever the problem is complex, depth is relevant. So if we're asking complex questions, we want deep answers. Why? Because you can't deal with complex questions with superficial answers. To remind myself of this, I remember the statement of a great conservative critical thinker H.L. Mencken, who was a, an American journalist in the 20s and the 30s. And he, in his writing somewhere, he says this, for every complex question, there is a simple answer, and it is wrong. And this sticks in my mind. And I see the logic of it, because if the question is complex, the answer must deal with the complexity. And to deal with the complexity is going to take a certain amount of depth because complexity requires us to go to a new dimension of thinking in order to deal with it. So if you say, who are you? And all you want to know is my name, that's simple. But if you say, who are you? And you want to know philosophically, who am I? Then that question gets into complexity. It gets into a deeper sense of who I am, and it requires a deeper answer. So. How do we get at depth? We ask this question. How does your answer deal with the complexity of the question? What complexity of the question are you dealing with in giving us this answer? So if the question is, what can we do about the problem of drug addiction in this country? And you said, it's simple, just say no. I could then, as a questioner, say, how does that deal with the political problems involved? How does that deal with the psychological fact of addiction and the conditions under which people who are addicts can free themselves from that addiction? How does that deal with the money issues involved? How does that deal with the education that is involved for people to be persuaded that it makes sense to say no? How does that deal with the, un the correlation uh, between drugs and unemployment and depression and so forth? Well, it doesn't appear to deal with any complexity, and therefore the answer is superficial, and therefore we have to look for further answers. So the question that gets at depth is, what are the complexities of, these, of this question, and how is your answer dealing with it?